This is John McCutcheon, singer, songwriter, folk artist, dulcimer player, plays just about anything straight out of smoke rise. <laughs> straight up. I need that. That's, I need that on a t-shirt. <laughs> straight out of smoke awful. rise. There you go. <laughs> So this is your 41st album in 45 years. That's uh, quite an output. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm, uh, it's because I was raised before Ritalin. <laughs> well, How do was... you do that? How do you have such an output like that? Because some people take years to put together a project uh, from the moment they start writing and getting the melodies down and everything to the final output. Um, what is your inspiration for working so quickly and getting this uh, amount of work out? Well, um, in this particular case, um, it was probably the, f the first time in my life that I had no impediments at all to writing. I came back from a tour of Australia in mid-March and it was absolutely clear that I needed to self-quarantine to protect my family and loved ones. I'd been on, I'd been in Australia uh, for three weeks and then on a 24 hour plane ride. Um, so we have a little cabin up around LJ and I went up there with my dog. And you know, when I write at home, uh, it's time to come in and eat supper or it's time to fix supper or it's time to mow the lawn or you know, I have to do an interview or whatever, and the whole world shut down. I had no commitments at all, except my agent calling me up saying, well, another weekend just got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to use my time creatively, and once I just fell into that groove, it was... Uh, part of what I did in the course of the day and I was up there for about three weeks and um, ended up quite unexpectedly with an album. Yeah, Alan Jay is one of these places because I would go up there for the apple picking festivals. Right. Like it's beautiful in the fall time, and Ella Jay is uh, northwest Georgia up I seventy five, and he folks coming down I seventy five. That's that's a beautiful place. So I, I can imagine that was very inspirational to uh, not just the the current events of the day that were helping to write these lyrics, but just being in that atmosphere. Oh, and yeah, and and some of the songs on this album. Uh, were inspired by events that were very much about me sitting on the porch there one night as the sun was going down and that kind of violet hour that is between sundown and dark i saw all the little lights coming on and in the in the houses and the towns below where my lofty perch was and it inspired the song vespers um I saw a squirrel raiding my <laughs> my bird feeder one day, That's and I thought, you know, there was a time in my life this would have really pissed me off. But, <laughs> I know the feeling. So I, I wrote the song Control uh, based on that. Other things came from conversations I had with old friends, and they would say something or tell me a story or, you know, I would think about something that afterwards and... Uh, Everything was fodder. Everything was grist for the mill. And all kinds of stuff came out. Yeah, you could tell just from that whole listing of songs. It's about what, 18 tracks on this yeah, new album, it's, Cabin it's Favor. It's a pretty generous album. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're really like very to the point. You could just tell that they um, had been inspired by just like that day. Just like Frontline is your opening track. And what, what, what came to you with that? Was there an actual news report, just simply generally reading and seeing well, how nurses and doctors it, were it's, working? It's interesting. In um, what was it, four years ago, I had a cancer scare. Mm. And I realized that all of the language in our healthcare system is, is warlike. You know, the battle against cancer. And here, all of a sudden, it was frontline. And... So the chorus just, you know, you realize, and I have two brothers who um, were career Marines, and in talking to them about their experiences, you know, when you're in the midst of things, there's no time to be scared. Uh, you, you just, you know, you just 
stand your ground. And so that kind of lingo uh, came forward. And of course, everyone was talking about the front lines. But it, it, it's, it's a group of people that we often don't think about until we or someone in our family gets sick and you realize the tremendous skill and sacrifice that goes on, especially these people who, when they were doing their job, were not only putting themselves at risk, but you realize that they were sacrificing their time with their families. And they couldn't go home and be with their kids. Um, and every day they went in, it meant another two weeks that they couldn't be with their kids or their, or their spouse or whomever. Um, so I'm always looking for those, those people that don't have an opportunity to get feted um, and write songs for them. I, this time, you know, the whole world was realizing how important they were, and I just thought they, you know, they deserved a song. Absolutely. I mean, what heroes. And just as this is going on, because there's no end point to this. We just, you know, with most news stories, I've been in news for many years now. And, you know, you know, there's an end date. There's a campaign going on. There's an end date with this. We don't know. So I think that's really beautiful to uh, give a tribute to people who are really just giving it their all. And they're under so much tremendous stress. It's Well, and, and, and the interesting thing about what's going on, especially in Georgia right now, and I have no idea when, you know, this might get out to the public. Um, but when we decide that we're just tired of wearing masks and tired of not going to the beach and tired of not eating in a restaurant or going to our favorite pub, uh, all those people that we have said, yes, they're heroes, we're creating more work for them. Um, oh, absolutely. And so it's, it's a lot. I, there's a song I didn't put on there that was a, a really late entry called uh, Killed by Stupid which is basically saying, I won't be killed by stupid. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not going to go to the gym and get a tattoo and then go bowl again, um, which was <laughs> the first thing in Georgia that opened up. Like, that's the backbone of our economy here. It's, you know, where I, you, know, you would think those would be the last places. You must feel open. like you can't keep up with this. I mean, here you put this release out. You can almost do one almost every month, it seems like. News is really going faster than I've ever seen it go these days. It is. And, you know, I keep getting asked, you know, when are you going to write your Trump songs? And, and you know, there's really a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, but it's not really funny. Anymore. Yeah. And... And I'm of an age now where what I'm most interested in is, is writing about the stuff that's hard, writing about those things that where we might fight, find some common ground. I mean, granted, uh, if, if something really stupid comes along, like alternative facts, you know, if, if we agree to that, then every parent is really in trouble when they're <laughs> talking to their kids. Um, but, you know, having something that captures a moment because my Cuban father-in-law once told me he said you know the interesting thing that happens in in a totalitarian whether it be a fascist or communist uh, regime is that everything has to serve the state everything is politicized art is politicized yeah. the newspapers are politicized and everything and and that's what happens. Your children become politicized. And I realized that that's kind of what's happened. Everything, you know, the pandemic should not be politicized. It's a public health situation. And now you've got people, you know, signaling whether they're Democrat or Republican by whether they wear a mask or not, which is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I'm looking for is those places where everybody can say, no matter how much we disagree on everything else, yeah, we got to we got to give props to the healthcare workers and the postal service and the people who are bagging our groceries for heaven's sake. Um, these are people that are keeping the wheels running. And or as the second cut on the album, I mean, everybody was just stopped dead in their tracks when they heard that John Prine died. Yes, I was going to ask you. So, John Prine, how well did you know John Prine and? In your I knew him okay. Um, we had done a, a, a several shows together, and the second verse in that um, 
in that song talks about a night at the Cambridge Folk Festival in England where John and I and a bunch of performers had met in the hotel bar and when the <laughs> when the house band went on break, we just took over the stage. Mm. And, and the house band was never allowed to come up again. We just took over everything and shut the whole joint down. And every time I saw John or talked to him on the telephone, <clears throat> he'd, he'd always bring that up about what a great night that was, which also happened to be Stevie Goodman's birthday. And John and Stevie were really close. Um, and so it was a emotionally charged night. And it was one of those nights that you just don't forget. And I'm glad I had an opportunity to sort of relive it by the song. But John was John was a genius. Yeah. Uh, he was, any damn fool can be complicated. His simplicity, his directness, his kind of sideways humor and his heart uh, just opened people up in ways that, you know, is there, a, has a better line than there's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes? Yeah, ever been, yeah. Ever been written? It's just so. It says, or later in the same song, my kids are running around in someone else's clothes. I mean, it says so much with so little. So John um, touched people in ways that, you know, maybe he didn't even know. So simple, but yet so deep. And it seemed to me like just after his passing, then all the, uh, the the analysis, the accolades, everything just came out all at once. It was, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was another one of those moments where we could stop and say, yeah, we're all feeling this right now. We're all feeling this right now. And that's the, that's the interesting thing for me as a writer. And, and it's, it, it's personal, yet this goes into the whole theme of the cabin fever. It just all melded together here with somebody's personal and had passed away from COVID. And that to me is just... Um, it's incredible. Sheltered in place. That's the, the obvious track here. How did you feel about when you were writing that? Well, that came from a, um, a conversation I had actually with the same guy who alerted me to John's death, Richard Bresnahan, my best friend from college. Um, he's still at the college. In fact, he's the artist in residence up there. When I, as a 20 year old, stuck out my thumb and headed down to Appalachia, to learn how to play the banjo, he uh, headed east to study traditional Japanese pottery. And so he and I have maintained a close relationship for 45 years now. And um, he happened to mention to me that the local Dorothy Day house uh, had closed its doors, which serviced the homeless community. And it just made me think, wow, now these are people who have been sheltered in place for years. Uh, you know, they, they are invisible to us. Um, we all know them. They, they're at our stop signs or traffic lights. Um, and what are they going through right now? So taking, taking a commonly used term like sheltered in place in much the same way you had um, frontline and sort of turning it 90 degrees and seeing what it looked like and also using it as a vehicle to hopefully, you know, what you try to do with any kind of art um, is open up people's hearts. And commonly what I hear about this song was, uh, boy, I never even thought about that. And so, I mean, giving people a, a new idea, that's a pretty, that's a pretty great accomplishment. That's amazing. And you, you, the amount of time you spent in Appalachia, it's just, that's a hard area of this country. Just the things that they go through and still are to this day. And now they're and dealing with so many. it's beautiful. Apple. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's still what I think about. It's why I felt so at home doing this project in the North Georgia mountains. Because finally I was back in the mountains, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, Living down, you know, I'm in the shadow of Stone Mountain down here, but it's definitely not the same as being up in Blue Ridge, Cherry Log, LJ, Jasper, that whole area where you're you're actually perched up there, and it just feels like home. Are you that disconnected up there? Is it a, the, the cabin is just so far out into the woods that uh, you basically unplug? Oh, I definitely unplug. Um, but I've, you know, I've got internet there and we have electricity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, the, <coughs> excuse me, 
There are other cabins around, but at that particular time, there was no one around. Because so many of the pe- so many of those cabins up there, people rent them out, or they don't. There's only a handful of people who live there full time, and I was essentially living there full time. Um, yeah. And had I not had a family at home, had I not been traveling from across the world, I wouldn't have been there. So it was a particularly um, isolated time. So you had a whole batch of songs, like uh, thirty songs, before yeah, you about- went into quarantine. Yeah, I probably wrote about 25 or 30 songs. And, um, you know, when you don't have any disturbances, um, you write a song and say, oh, well, cool. Let's strike while the proverbial iron is hot and let's start another one. And there's some that are languishing because I I got to a point where I just didn't know what I was going to do with it anymore. Um, And luckily, I have a little studio set up up there so that I could quickly run and remember the melody <laughs> because I only yeah. write down the words. So it was, a, it was a lot of, you know, being out on the porch and dashing down to the studio below and, and doing a quick demo. And then coming home, uh, finally after three weeks, to, back to Smoke Rise and going into my little home studio and uh, doing a crash course and learning all the songs, recording them and then sending them up to my engineer up in the DC area who magically makes me sound good. It takes, and now we have all these nice tools on our little laptops and everything. It's just so much uh, easier in certain ways, but you still have to have that talent as an engineer. Oh, gosh, you have to have ears, and you have to, you know, you have to have to know what technology to call on to serve you. Uh, and this guy, Bob Dawson is his name. He has a studios up there called Bias Studios, and I've, he's been my engineer forever. Um, he just knows what my voice sounds like. He knows what makes me sound good uh and he also we know one another so well that he i completely trusted him in taking two or three vocal passes and constructing one acceptable one out of it and he was dead on 99.9 percent of the time that's fantastic how does the how does the whole process start for you and we probably talked about this before and i know this probably gets asked a lot lyrics first then melody melody comes first then right to the melody uh yes all of the above uh it, it, it's either it, way you can switch it, it up. just depends in this case it was mostly the lyrics um that came first but you have to have some kind of a a, a, a rhythmic tempo to the way that the words are written and the way they fall off your tongue so that you know that you can't put the accent on the wrong syllable at a, it, for a particular yeah. meter. Uh, and a melody seems to kind of organically develop out of that. Um, I've tended to, to go for simpler melodies. <laughs> Thinking back to John Prine, uh, I remember I was in some kind of a writer's workshop with him at some festival and um, and I happened to say, well, you know, look how much use John Prine, for instance, gets out of three melodies. And he turned to me and says, I have that many? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so generally the lyrics come first, but sometimes the, sometimes the music comes first. And in each case whatever begins kind of speaks to the other and it, it tends to fall into place pretty quickly. Nice. There's one track uh, that kind of stuck off called Dog Talking Blues. <laughs> what, is the, what is the origin beyond that? behind that? Well, um, you know, there are there is a form called the Talking Blues and I just happen to have a guitar here with me. Let me uh, make sure it's I'll plug it in here. Uh, um, there's an old form called the Talking Blues. I first heard it from listening to the Woody Guthrie records that went. Uh, if you want to get to heaven, let me tell you what to do. Got to grease your feet in a little mutton stew. Slide out of the devil's hand, then you ooze over in the promised land. Going greasy. So 
it was, it's kind of archetypal white rap music, I guess. Uh, and and uh, it was used a lot um, by different people. Bob Dylan used it. Um, Pete Seeger used it. Uh, Woody Guthrie used it a lot. And uh, I've used it a lot over the years, uh, whether it be stringing together uh, Yogi Berra's malapropisms or, or even... Um, Uh, well, on this one, in this case, it was uh, uh, my dog talking blues. That, uh, pets are loving this pandemic. I mean, <laughs> oh, I know. You know, my dog don't know no quarantine. She's just happy I'm around. She'll fall asleep right at my feet, never make a sound. Content that I can sit for hours, reading in my chair. Sometimes she'll open just one eye to make certain. Maybe eating some, getting clumsy, clumsy enough maybe to drop it right. So it's just kind of uh, you know it was a fun break from number one writing melodies. It's a form I've used a lot, um, and it just felt like it'd be kind of fun to have something like that on the album. This was this is one I I actually intentionally sat down to write. Unlike the other kind of spoken word thing you know, the bean. Yeah. Because I was talking to um, a, a number of different people who were, and my wife has this thing on her Facebook page that she puts out every night called the virtual diner. You know, what are you eating tonight? And <laughs> inevitably, um, first of all, people were eating better than they'd ever eaten normally in their, in their suppers. You know, you're seeing all this at, at, our, at our house too. We're really working on, on the COVID-19, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, uh, but lots of people seem to be discovering beans for the very first time as a staple in their meals. And now being married to a Cuban. Yeah, easy protein. You know, they're, they're pretty standard yeah. fare. And it, it starts off, uh, you know, I'll never forget the first time, though you may think me crazy. It was in a mountain kitchen, the Kentucky town of Daisy. It was there at Roscoe Holcomb's house. At supper time was spread that Appalachian staple that is soup beans and cornbread. Now the bean in question, Pinto, and the cornbread never sweet. Add onions and some chow chow. Mm, it's the finest thing you'll eat. Uh, and it goes on, of course. It's a peon to beans. Um, and it was just one of those things that, oh, look at everybody's discovering beans. Well, <laughs> beans have been a part of my life forever. So I, I thought there's nothing worth that's not worth writing about. So have you been cooking a lot more? Is uh, your wife, Carmen, who is yeah. also an artist, I believe. And yeah, she's, a, she's a wonderful children's book author, Carmen Angraditi, um, well, well known and loved throughout Georgia. Um, yeah, we've been cooking these amazing meals, and and uh, tonight I'm making uh, a recipe I found in the New York Times for uh, ginger chicken thighs. Nice. And, and it's something I've, uh, you know, I, I had to prepare a marinade yesterday and leave it overnight, and we're also having uh, bourbon peach ice cream. That sounds very good. I know. I yeah. know. I'll, I'll, I'll save you some. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds wonderful. So, so we're, we're yeah. experimenting a lot. And every now and again, like last night, I said, are you tired of cooking? She said, yes, I am tired of cooking. I said, let me make tacos. <laughs> so, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, more elegant fare. But, but what's really nice is that we're actually sitting down and eating together. And we're making... Um, making that a much more regular part of our work because, I mean, of our day, because our work a lot of times intervenes. And if she's in the middle of either a deadline run or she's just in the groove, or if I am in the groove, we each know enough about this kind of work that it's like, no excuses necessary. I totally get it. There's a plate in the oven waiting for you. So, but this, this period of time, we're just saying, let's sit down and eat together. It's been wonderful. 
So how does it work? Was she in the cabin up there with you for a time or some of the time or any no. other time? No, we were, I was, I was off in Australia and I was there, I think actually the day I left, which was the 16th of March, uh, was the first time I heard people actually taking it all seriously. I'd been at these festivals in little malarial tents with three or 4,000 people wow. who would, you know, come up to me afterwards and throw their arm around me and say, let's take a selfie, mate. And then go into a concert hall with four or 500 people. And it was, you know, nobody was taking it seriously. I mean, it hadn't really hit. Um, and so, and then I'm on an airplane, which is like a, you know, a winged Petri dish for 24 hours. And so I got home and it was like, I'm not taking any chances. Plus, uh, Carmen's 89-year-old mother lives with us. Mm. And it was the only responsible thing to do. So, no, we did not see one another essentially for six weeks. Yeah, that's that's amazing, though, how you could do that. And, you know, you both could do these things. Your work, you could do it from home. I mean, a lot of people can't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you're at home, a lot sequestered and there have been lots of tales of people being sequestered and it it wasn't easy for them. No, Uh, no. I remember I remember seeing a a poll that, you know, after three or four weeks, uh, a majority of parents said they would consider homeschooling. And I just thought, give it another three or four weeks. (laughs) We'll We'll take another poll and see how they still feel about it. And in fact, there was an there was a, an op ed in the in the New York Times this morning that said, you know, the 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 nasty truth of of these times, and the law of the pandemic is you can have children or a job, but it's <laughs> damn near impossible to do both. So you know, um, you do your work in in fits and starts. You squeeze it in when you can. I have a friend who's a poet who writes beautiful concise, tight little poems. And I said, gosh, I wish I could write like that. How do you do that? She, she said, I'm a mom. I, I, can, I have like an hour a day I can actually write. This is as much as I can get done. So you, you fill the time with what you have. What a talent. So obviously you miss live performing. That's I do. I do, though, you know, I'm, I'm pushing 68 years old right now. And a lot of my friends, friends and family are saying, so you're old enough to retire. You're collecting your union pension. Um, You're on social security. You got Medicare. What are you going out there for? And I feel the most like I'm doing my job when I'm in a room with a few hundred people. And for that couple hours, maybe we were able to jointly construct some kind of community even if it's for just an hour or two. And I think that was my introduction to music, uh, I mean, to concerts. You know, the, f- the first concert I ever went to was Pete Seeger. And mm-hmm. his, his concerts were all about, uh, not only community, but about participation. You became part of a choir when you walked in there. And that sense of we're creating this thing in concert with one another became a touchstone for me that um, I really miss right now. And I'm trying to learn this new technology that's wrapped around this new art form of doing these online live streaming concerts that somehow knits together, you know, eight, 1200 people who are stopping in from all over the world. And it's a form that I don't think is going to go away. Uh, but live performance will never go away for me. Um, I think I think things are going to be really different for a couple of years. Um, just the, I was talking to Eddie Owen out at the, uh, you know, his great venue out there, the Red Clay Music Foundry, and it holds nearly three hundred people. And he said, according to the guidelines, I could put maybe sixty or seventy people in oh. here. And it makes, you know, it, it puts the infrastructure of our entertainment industry completely, uh, you know, on edge. Um, so I'm starting to do a lot more concerts where it's sponsored by, say, the Red Clay Music Foundry. And they sell tickets. And yeah. they get a cut 
I get a cut, my agent gets a cut because this this ecosystem in which the entertainment world lives requires that we have presenters and that we have agents. And those two forces haven't been making any money on these live reforms. I mean, what, you know, what most live performances is busking, essentially. Yeah, that's really what it is, just electronically. It's electronic busking. And, yeah. And... Um, but it's what we got, you know, we're, it's, 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 it's the new abnormal and uh, we're all trying to learn new things and be creative. I mean, with, with this album, for instance, I realized the reason that it's an online only, you know, download only is because I didn't have the money to manufacture a CD and CDs really sell at gigs. Um, right. But also... I did it this way because I had no money to do it another way. And then I thought, well, okay, let's look at through the other end of the telescope. I don't have any money to buy your album, John. So I thought, okay, well, let's just make this a pay what you can. And I was relying on the kind of innate generosity that I've seen during this time. And lots of people who didn't, you know, if you don't have a job, you don't have an income, for heaven's sakes, you still need the music here. It's yours. It's free. That's fine. Because I have the faith that there's people on the other end of that economic spectrum they are going to say, okay, here's a hundred bucks for yeah. this thing. And that kind of stuff has happened. It's been, it's been, um, I, I don't even want to say astonishing. I think it's been affirming. Good. Good. You have that fan base. You've developed such a fan base over so many years now. I think they, they feel dedicated to that. I think that's beautiful. You could do this on it's folkmusic.com. Mm -hmm. Go right to it. It says Cabin Fever. You just click on that and you can uh, download and pay what you can. And yeah, yeah. And if, if you don't have money um, or you don't feel like it's worth anything, uh, <laughs> you know, there's no questions asked. It's it's. It's a complete act of faith on both sides. You don't know what you're getting. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to pay. And you just sort of have to say, okay, I'm doing okay. I didn't, you know, I'm working from home. I didn't lose my job. Yeah, I got a, I got a little spare change. <laughs> it's really, really nice. Good, good work. Um, I guess we could just close this out here. Just uh, if you want to play a little uh, bit of uh, the opening track, Frontline. Sure. Let me get my fingers on here. I'm on a 12 hour shift, seven day streak. Haven't had my children in over two weeks. I can tell you more, but I'm too tired to speak. This is, this is life on the front.
there's no time to be scared Just pray or prepare Just stand your ground I pray I stay healthy Though the chances are slim I pray it's a battle that will finally win But tomorrow no man I'll show up again and This is life on the front line But tomorrow no man show up again this is life on the front line bravo thank you very much it's again on music.com you could order the new album called cabin fever available from your computer that's awesome thank you very much Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Great to talk to you again.